and start um, opening the meeting of the Roxbury Montpelier or Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors, um, starting at six thirty one, and let's do roll. Um, Remick family. Oh no, here. <laughs> I'll fix that. Uh, boy, we have some some uh, emeritus members tonight. Uh, Amanda. Uh, Key, here. Uh, Jerry. Here. Anakin. Here. Mia. Here. Kristen. Here. Andrew. Here. And Emma. Here. Um, anyone I missed? I think so. Excellent. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended the community forum. Uh, a public comment. I can't, looks like we definitely have some members from the public. Um, uh, the way we do this is uh, there's if you hit the participants um, button down at the bottom of your screen, a list pops up, and um, in that list there at the bottom there's a raise hand button that you can press. If you can't figure that out, um, feel free to either physically raise your hand uh, on the screen. I can see all of you, um, or just take take mute off and, and give a shout out. Um, Tina, uh, see your hand is up. And Good please evening, introduce yourself and for uh, the Orca folks. Pardon me? I said, please introduce yourself for the, the Orca folks. Oh, uh, Tina Muncy, uh, Montpelier resident. And I um, came today to say that I have been waiting to see an item on one of your school board agendas that would allow you to discuss the discrepancy in costs to educate a student at the Roxbury Village School compared to the rest of the schools in the district. And unless I've missed it, I haven't seen it come up. And I did notice on this agenda that it says you're discussing the May retreat agenda and I had heard that perhaps you were going to begin this discussion at the May retreat. And I just would like to ask the board to consider instead beginning this discussion at your next school board meeting so that it's a public discussion. Because it seems to me if you're going to change the educational delivery system or organization of any of the schools in the district, the people in Roxbury and certainly the people in Montpelier would be interested to hear your deliberations and be able to take part. So if you weren't going to discuss it for the May retreat, then I will ask you please to consider discussing it at your next school board meeting also. Thank, thank you, you Tina. for considering this. Yes, yeah, thank you, Tina. And I, I do want to let people know that um, while we are referring to to the May retreat with the word retreat. It is not really retreat. It is a public meeting uh, open to the public and it will be available via Zoom for anyone who wants to listen into all or some of it. Um, so there should be a, a warning of that and an agenda posted, although it will, will be at a, an unusual time. Uh, it'll be during a work day. Uh, oh, that's it what also I was going to away. say. Is it in the evening or is it during a work day? It's during the workday, but it should also be available um, for viewing later. Great. Uh, anyone else for public comment? Uh, Amanda? I, I just want to reply to Tina that um, for your comment, and I know that this is something in your mind, and I really appreciate it, and we are here, and, and I think the conversation around, um, like, for me, 
public and community inputs really, really important. So I think that any conversation that we have about those big topics, we certainly, I will certainly make sure that there is a conversation around how to get public input into the conversation. So I just wanted to say that that is really important to me. Um, how do we engage with people that care about these issues and specifically in, in Roxbury. So I just wanted to affirm your point that we will take that into consideration and thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Um, Jim, Jim, do you just want to provide just like a 30 second overview of what was discussed kind of a year ago on this topic? Because we were talking about a robust public process and because of the pandemic and everything going on last summer, we put this discussion on hold. Um, yeah, I can give a quick overview. We, uh, before uh, you know, the world turned upside down, um, we engaged the uh, uh, creative solutions and try to figure out how to describe them. But they're, uh, they're a group that works on uh, facilitating collaborative processes among other uh, consulting roles uh, to put together a community visioning processing around uh, the district in general, but Roxbury in particular, uh, to, to bring the two communities together uh, to figure out uh, a, uh, a path forward for, for that school that would be in the best interest of both communities with input from both communities. Um, and we started out with some listening sessions uh, and uh, then the pandemic hit and, and that work largely got, got put on hold. So um, you know, one of the things we'll be discussing at the retreat and at future meetings is you know, restarting that visioning process. Um, and you know, kind of what 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 we pick up a year later. So we uh, that's something that yeah you know, was continues to be a priority. Um, it it got put on hold, and we're also hoping that uh, that process will benefit from us being able to to meet in person as well. Because I think uh, you know having having this in a situation where we can uh, you know be in be in be in the room together as as two communities um, and and form the type of relationships that I think will uh, lead to a good process forward. And also, you know, the type of relationships, frankly, that that were formed and I think helped uh, with the merger in the first place. Uh, that that process of, of community members from both Montpelier and Roxbury coming together and, and talking these things through uh, in a series of meetings uh, and in person was, was valuable. And, and uh, uh, yeah, we will, Hopefully, we, we will pick that up again. All right, excellent. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands. Uh, so I think we can move to uh, the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move we approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Mia. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, any discussion? Yeah, I just want to say the, the assistant principals in the consent agenda, correct, Libby? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, I just I just want to say um, welcome to Jess Wells to our school district. She's someone who I've known for a number of years who has taught with my wife, and I know she's very well respected in her current school district, and I'm very excited to see what she does at MSMS. So welcome, Jess. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, and welcome. Yeah, welcome, Jess. It's we're excited to have you on board next year. Um, Jill. Um, doing well. Wait, um, um, Jim, Amanda just raised her hand. For oh, sorry. Discussion. Yes, Amanda. Oh, I'm sorry. I I think I did a bad mistake. Okay. Uh, well, you're up next for uh, the vote, so. Um... Oh. Yes. 
I'm voting on the consent agenda. Under the consent agenda. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Anakin. Aye. Jerry. Aye. Mia. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Andrew. Aye. And Emma. Aye. Uh, and congrats, Libby, on your promotion <laughs> for coaching coaching the middle school basketball. Added to the exciting. <laughs> vaccine clinic coordinator, <laughs> COVID pandemic relief, basketball coach. And I, I can guess which one is your favorite. Um, great, uh, board discussion. Um, we have, uh, I know it says Kate Stevenson, but um, she has recently vaccinated family in. Um, so she is spending time with them. Uh, uh, so uh, Ken Jones uh, very kindly uh, stepped in to give her some time with the, her family. And I know Ken is not only a uh, former board member, who it's good to see again, but um, has been deeply involved in this project. Uh, so I will turn it over to Ken uh, for a discussion on um, the district's role in Montpelier's energy audit. And um, the agenda says Andrew LaRosa, but I'm not seeing him on the screen. Andrew's um, here. Is he? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, there he is. Sorry. I, I see him now. Okay. Um, so, uh, Ken and Andrew. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off. Um, I am here representing the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee, and I am a, a poor substitute for Kate. Kate's been incredibly effective uh, at leading that organization for the last few years. She has, uh, now it's Amy Gamble, just so you know, who is the chair of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. We were, we were formed as the Montpelier Energy team many, many years ago, probably somewhere in the 15 to 18 years ago. But it was in 2011 that the city provided us, or it was, we have a charter with city council to provide um, advice on energy issues. And in 2011, uh, that was uh, around the district heat plant. Um, and since then, we've helped facilitate the construction of the two solar fields, um, one on Log Road, which is in Montpelier, and the other is in Sharon. Um, and together, that's a megawatt of solar, and the school district participates in the use of that. It's a net metering project. So you folks get a little bit of an economic, or we, we the subset school, we gets a, an economic benefit from participating in that solar project. Um, one, another one of the big projects underway now is the, um, the renovation of the wastewater treatment plant, uh, which just recently has geared up so that it now takes um, additional fog, which is fats, oils, and grease, um, and makes a lot of methane. And it, we're hoping that, so that, that's in place, um, and that methane is used to substitute for all of the fossil fuel use at the plant, and, and then some, and it's the and then some that we hope we are able to generate some electricity. Um, that decision probably is going to be made in the next few months. Um, but the reason for my being here tonight is to talk about our overall goal for the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee and the city, the city council has agreed to this, um, which is to be by 2030 to have 100% of our energy resources be renewable. Um, and that's, of course, quite a challenge, um, but we, we've made great steps um, and we would very much hope that the schools can participate in that discussion and the decisions necessary to, to move that forward as well. So I have some slides and um, other, I, I don't know if I have the ability to share my screen. Yes, you do, Ken, you can share your screen. Um, where it says share screen, you think that thing might do it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, be a good place to start. <laughs> and I'll start there. So part of this, this is just to give us a, a little bit of history because I, I need to acknowledge that the schools have done a great job um, in terms of energy, um, but this is the overall, this includes schools, this is uh, the overall uh, energy use by the city of Montpelier, and you can see it's in those 
essentially three categories where we'll start at the bottom and the bottom that orange part is electricity. And you'll see that there's been some significant decreases there. The fleet, um, which includes a lot of the municipal vehicles. I, I don't know if it includes the school buses. Um, it may or may not, I don't know that. Um, and then blue is thermal. So that's the use of fuel oil, propane um, to heat our buildings. And it includes the, the wood of the district heat plant. So this is total use and it's not broken down yet by fuels. Um, So this then identifies the where that energy is being used again in terms of those three categories. Um, and you can see the schools there to the right where the big one, this is why I don't think it includes school buses because there's no little gray bar. Um, but you can see there's the electricity use and the, the thermal, the heating of your buildings, the large buildings. And you can see the wastewater treatment plant. That's I think WRRF is water resource recovery facility. Um, and that's history or fiscal 20 and the thermal part of that um, will is being addressed again through this uh, methane generation. So what you saw there just in a different form, um, the in terms of energy use, and this is on a sort of a BTU basis, you know, electricity represents less than a quarter, it's the thermal, it's the big piece. And then here's, as I say, this is some evidence that, that there has been some um, great progress. Uh, so this is electricity use over the last 10 years. Um, and you can see that the, let's say the high, all the schools have seen significant reduction. Um, and I've lost track of what some of those were. I think there were a lot of control systems put into place, um, certainly lighting, um, and, but maybe some of you folks know even more of the details as to what was the the basis of some of those reductions, but that's great. And but but also you should know that electricity and, and the state has made some great progress in terms of of climate issues. Electricity in Vermont is pretty clean. I'm not going to say it's perfect, and hopefully it gets better over time. But electricity, we're, we've done a great job both in terms of the efficient use of electricity, but also in our electricity supplies, so that it is not the the does not provide the lion's share of contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. And then this tells the the solar story um, where 16 fiscal 16 and 17 we brought on the Sharon and log road plants so that even even that reduced use of electricity we have a significant portion that's that is at home renewable uh, the, the blue is still you know the state state's use of ISO New England sources still has a lot of renewable in it um, but the, the green part is, is ours. That's the part that the Montpelier has taken responsibility for doing its own generation. Hey, Ken, I'm just gonna, Ken, can I jump back in on that one? I, I don't wanna disturb your thing. Just wanna let folks know by the end of next year, that should be 100% where we've got net metering accounts now for Main Street Middle and Roxbury. And those uh, facilities are just being ramped up now. So they should be fully online by the end of 21. So that, that's, that's solar great. should be 100% by the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, and, and yeah, a big pat on the back. I mean, you you, you guys are doing great. And, and, and I'm proud of the little role that I played when I was on the board to kind of encourage this, but you folks are really following through. And, and we all thank you. The world thanks you. And then here's thermal, um, where you can see, I, I Union Elementary had a significant period where there was um, where we did some renovation work and saw some significant reductions in the overall thermal load. Now, this, this isn't this isn't again looking at the energy sources. This is just what it takes to heat that building. And you know, the, especially Union and Main Street being older buildings, it's it's some challenges to to heat those buildings. They weren't designed necessarily for heating efficiency in mind. Uh, the high high school. Um, is a little more recent um, and so it's a little harder to get those gains um, but still you can see here the trajectory we saw some significant gain, some improvements at Union and some improvements both at the high school and at Main Street. And this then looks at the source of that thermal heat. And this is, this is the story of the, of the district heat plant. The district heat plant is a wood-fired plant. It, is, it connects to Union Elementary. So as we 
brought that online, uh, fully online by fiscal 15. Um, you can see that um, the portion of the thermal load is being addressed by renewable sources. So, so that's, the, that's, that's our history. And again, what, what we at Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee and City Council has signed on to, is we want to aim for 2030. We want to get all of these, both the electricity bar and the thermal bars to be renewable. And the piece again that I haven't included, which is an important discussion as well, is transportation. Um, and we, part, we, we, we haven't had a lot of success at the city level, um, but it is gonna be a focus as we move forward. Um, the availability of vehicles, um, especially large vehicles for um, renewable fuels is harder. Um, but but it's, but but I don't don't want to think that we've forgotten it because you note know, it's a it's a significant um, part of the energy use and uh, we need to look at some creative solutions for providing renewable sources for transportation as well. Um, so uh, for a little while we've been having discussion um, with the superintendent and with some of the leadership of the board about what you folks can do. And I know the students have also stepped up to say, you know, what, what can you, how can we formalize, how can you formalize the um, actions of moving towards a more re renewable energy future? Um, and we, we have, you know, a couple of ideas um, that we're moving forward on. One is we want to have a student um, on the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee, and I'm, I'm working with some folks in the district to help identify that student. Another is for you folks to have the, the discussion about signing on to or having your own version of a long-term goal for renewable energy use for reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, and the third, which I, we're making some good progress on, is just to make sure that we can maintain the communication. So, and especially, you know, this year, there's some, there's some resources out there. As we all know there's federal resources that the state is distributing um, to do, to take on some activities to help make for a more resilient future, which largely, which can address some of these energy issues. So again, we want the city to work with the schools to say, hey, there's some opportunities here. Can we work together on some of these? How are, what is our progress towards the goals? So again, that's my purpose tonight is just kind of tee this up um, to, to get you folks to, to identify what it is that you can do to continue this discussion and strive towards some policy goals that help us achieve a, a cleaner energy future. So Ken, this, yeah. is, this is Andrew. I just wanna chime in here. Just so you know, a couple meetings ago, uh, the board uh, referred this issue to the policy committee, which is going to be meeting after our retreat next month. We have a bunch of, we're just wrapping up negotiations with every one of our labor unions, wrapping up, SRO work and, and a bunch of other time intensive work, but this is this is um, an important issue to the board. So it has been referred to the policy committee. We also created a facilities and energy committee that's going to also begin meeting this summer as well, which will meet with the student earth group, as well as we'll have a representative who will uh, be a liaison with the city's energy committee as well. Um, and Andrew, I know is also, I'll kick it to Andrew, but I also know that, you know, we want to be involved in the energy audit. That's going to be really helpful right. to the administration and also to the board and making decisions moving forward. Yeah, I did forget to mention that piece, right? We, we've hired VEIC to help us look at each of the buildings um, to identify sort of a menu of activities um, that can help move each of those buildings to a more renewable sort of, of, of thermal fuels and yeah and, and we're working with the schools on that and that's great excellent um andrew do you want to add anything or should we open up questions um no i mean i think that uh i'm you know i'm excited for whatever direction uh i'm given to take with the buildings and, and the goals that you want to achieve uh, i look forward to Continuing, we've had some communications with uh, the EIC regarding our energy usage so far, primarily around transportation at, at the moment so far. Um, 
and it'll be great to get that report to see what their suggestions are or what their you know their ideas are on on meeting that goal um and i think that's a document that we should all read and digest to see what we're up uh, you know the challenges and opportunities that we're facing us before we make any you know too many bold grand gestures to wait up to wait a month or two because if i understand correctly that report's due in june correct i believe so june or july yeah so we're pretty close to getting that report um so i think that the timing seems to all be falling in line um, um, somebody, oh sorry go ahead andrew i mean if you if you'd like just for your own knowledge you I can tell you a little bit about some of the energy things we've been doing and we've been looking at if anyone wants that um, or if we want to wait until that group is is formed and we can formalize these sort of give a, a more formal presentation in a month or two. I wouldn't mind a quick preview. I don't okay. you have to get into detail, but yeah, so some of the quick things. Uh, like I say, the net metering where we've got all the buildings are all lined up should by, by the end of next, by the end of this year, everything should be fully in line. Um, that the indoor air quality grant did a, was a great opportunity. We spent nearly $170,000 on our mechanical systems, um, having a contractor or go through them all and our controls contractor and our engineer. And we were fortunate that we had our buildings, uh, commissioned retro commissioned by efficiency Vermont uh, last last fall so when it came to doing these indoor air quality work we had a running start at it everybody had been in our buildings which was great um, energy one of the biggest things we've got is um, not only where the energy is generated but how it's used in the buildings used in we are doing our beta tests on window renovation and replacement and or replacement this summer, we've got the contractors lined up. Uh, I have, we're waiting to get the final pricing on a couple of mock-up windows that we should have at the end of the week. We've got a contractor all in. So by the end of summer, by August 13th, we will have a sample windows for a group, whatever that group is, to go in and look at and open and close and shut and see what, see what we can think is the right solution, as well as having uh, a better cost estimate and timelines available to us to look at. Um, one of the things that uh, Grant put in front of you guys a couple meetings ago, a few meetings ago, I guess, uh, with regards to some fund balance was looking at um, the variable frequency drive pumps at the high school. These are the big circulator pumps that move water throughout. Right now, they're on or they're off. Uh, our engineer is specifying eight new pumps that will cycle up and cycle down, and they'll be high efficiency, and that's going to save a tremendous amount of money. Um, and I will have, I think I'll have some final like estimates of, of what the savings will be. Those reports are, the final reports are due to me this week. They've been kind of busy. I told them it's okay, they can wait another week. So that, we'll have that information. We should have those, we will have those in place for the next heating season. Um, the Roxbury heat pump project, uh, that one's kind of, you know, it's unfortunate. We don't have like a clear winner. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, we can do something that's, relatively simple and easy and kind of right off the shelf and will it be as high performing and as all encompassing as a more comprehensive project no but can we get our hands around it and operate it very simply and get it going right this summer without rebuilding a mechanical system that you don't know what you're getting into yes so that's a conversation when i get the far the formal report on that uh, i'll have a bill to speak to that but unfortunately a, a sort of a clear winner did not jump out of that one um, and the controls, um, our controls contractor, current controls contractor and our engineers uh, have got a, a very good handle on two different scopes at the high school. One is replace our, uh, replace our um, interface, our computer programming and rewire to old controls, add CO2 sensors in the classrooms and then phase in kind of controlling or replacing the actual little motors on the dampers and things like that over a rollout period or doing it all at once and, and hitting it all at once. That's going to be huge in that um, it won't save us energy. It, it'll save us energy in that right now, Tom sort of Tom Allen 
sort of back doors and keep things. The control system at the high school is relatively old. So he has to kind of trick some things to do things, some things. So we'll have a better handle on that. Uh, but in fact, we'll bring, we'll be bringing more fresh air into our buildings. So that's a good thing. So we'll, we'll, we'll use more energy, but we'll use it wisely and we'll get more fresh air into the building. So, um, like I say, that's getting formalized and that one, we really just have to, we'll have a cost estimate on that. It's clearly an estimate, but it should get us in the ballpark and we can start thinking about what's the best way to attack that. Um, and again, one of the things I think is the most important is that we've, we've reestablished a, a controls or a uh, mechanical service plan with a very good firm with Honeywell and even better, uh, the individual who services our building really <laughs> enjoys working in our in our buildings, enjoys working in schools, um, and has done a fabulous job for us and, and uh, will continue. And that's already built into our budget. So it's, you know, we've got $25,000 worth of service on our mechanical systems next year. So there's never a sort of, eh, let's wait until, you know, let's wait until the spring. Or It's like, if it needs to be done, it's going to be done. Um, so Big picture, that's some of the things that we've been working on. Awesome, that was super helpful. Uh, questions for um, for Ken or Andrew? Uh, Atticat. Thanks, Jim. Um, thank you for the, thank you, Ken and Andrew for, for walking us through all that. It was extremely helpful. Um, and Andrew, you went into the, the Roxbury um, items and things. Uh, one thing I was wondering um, with the presentation, we, I, we got to see the comparison between the different schools, but Roxbury wasn't in the mix unless I missed it. Um, and I was just, just curious where that fits in. Yeah, from a Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee perspective, you're right, that, that's, that's something that, that um, it, it's not in our arena. Okay, we, we, we aren't a part of the school district, so we're therefore not a part of, Mon of Roxbury. Um, so that's as, as we move forward, how to integrate the Roxbury schools into the overall discussion is something we, we're gonna need to discuss. Should in our report that we get from um, our engineers, should we should have a, um, a pretty good handle on if we go to heat pumps, how much oil are we gonna save versus electricity and, and, and how that would, so we can, we can, we'll at least be able to see, are we going to be able to do better in that building? Um, uh, Andrew. On, on that last point, I just wanted to clarify. So the, uh, the facilities and energy committee does have a representative from Roxbury on it. And the intention is certainly to incorporate Roxbury into this discussion, definitely at the school level, but that building also plays a key role for the municipality of Roxbury as well. I know that's where town meetings are held. Um, so yeah, and, and just so everybody else here is aware, since we've had for the past, the past two meetings and then this meeting, that's three meetings in a row where facilities and energy has been front and center on the agenda. Our crew decided that we were gonna wait uh, until after we got through this period to convene for the first time. So we will be doing that at some point and probably May or June for the first time. Thanks, Andrew. Um, other questions? Great, I have one. I noticed in the presentation that um, kind of citywide, there was a gradual um, reduction in the use in pretty much all energy sectors. Um, what's driving that? Is it all efficiency or are there other factors at play? It's mostly efficiency. Uh, so we, we've, uh, we've also established a revolving loan fund. Um, within the city to, to provide some resources to the various departments so that they can invest in, in buildings. Um, we've done the, we've done renovations of the windows at city hall. We've worked on the garage doors at the fire and police station. The fire and police station had some control issues. 
and the wastewater treatment plants, the largest user of energy, and, and we've already put some significant effort there. So it, it is, uh, yeah, I don't know if there's a, a way of, measure, uh, of measuring sort of municipal activity to see if there's a, a change in municipal activity that may have led to, to but I don't, I don't think there has been. Uh, we haven't changed the number of buildings, um, the wastewater treatment, water treatment, and the drinking water facility are pretty constant in terms of their utilization. Um, so efficiency. Um, I also noticed, and this is kind of a question for Andrew Larissa, that all the trends on thermal use in this, the three schools were down um, kind of overall, but I noticed MHS had kind of seemed to plateau and pick up again. Do you know what the cause of that is? Um, which slide were you talking with regards to electricity or heating? Thermal. Oil? So one of the tough things tough, difficult things about that is these calculations, thermal usage is based on fuel delivery and when you get it. We um, sign up for oil contracts. I've already bought next year's oil. And what we do is depending on where we are and, and like Tom and I just this week said, how much oil is in our tank? Do we fill them up? So we start the next year full. So it's sort of, you can kind of, you know, you got to look at it as a long, long, you know, year to year, it's a little tougher to say, do, are we doing better or worse? Because it really, did we start with a full tank of gas, or gas full tank of oil, or did we have to load up with, um, you know, an extra 10,000 at the beginning of the year? So I, I'd be careful about sort of year to year on, on oil usage, because that one or two deliveries can, can kind of throw that. I think, Ken, does that seem, does that... Yes, that is true. There, there was a bump in particular that I was just sure was a delivery scheduling piece, and and then you know the the, the year to year changes are also influenced by degree days. You know, twenty sixteen was a warm year, so things go down, and there's going to be a rebound the next year. But yeah, also it is that is based on delivery dates, and that is yeah hard to normalize. You could use a moving, you could use a moving five year average or something like that. Last year at this at this time, you guys probably would have wanted me to pick up the phone. We bought heating oil for ninety eight cents a gallon. So we didn't, we, you know, we were done with our heating season, but they picked up the phone and said, "You want ten thousand gallons for ten thousand dollars?" And we said, "Yep, <laughs> we'll top off our tanks." So yeah, no doubt, and the, the trend is 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 definitely um, downward. Uh, Kristen is. Uh, Kristen. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ken. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I was hoping to get a little bit more information about the VEIC um, process and the, the you know, report that would be the outcome of that and curious if it involves analysis only or if it will also include recommendations and just what we can expect to see come out of that. And I was wondering if that was something that was generated by the city, is it gonna include, and it's kind of been extended to the school district and um, and if it is gonna include the Roxbury School. I happen to be the Roxbury member that will be on the buildings and or the facilities and energy committee. So I'm interested to hear about that. Yeah, uh, so I'll try to characterize their work. It is essentially, a multi-building audit to identify the status of the buildings and to identify the strategies necessary to replace the existing use of fossil fuel. So, rec I mean, it's going to be a list of actions. And um, I, I'm not sure if the word recommendation will be in there or not, um, because the extent to which we look at cost effectiveness um, is going to be after after that work and how we can fund the things, the source of the funds for it. Um, and it is my understanding that it does not include the Roxbury School. Uh, again, we started as the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee um, to deal with Montpelier and it, and it will include the Montpelier schools, but right now I don't believe, and Andrew might know, but I don't believe it's gonna include the Roxbury building. It, it does not. Um, like I said, just because, but I can, uh, Christine, I can get you the, you know, if, if you, you want to build your knowledge base of the Roxbury mechanical systems, uh, I'm happy to give you a tour, but um, we also have the retro commissioning report that was done last year that kind of talks about the 
pros and cons and the good things and the bad things, as well as this additional, um, you know, report that we're going to get on heat pumps and all that. So we do, it's not on an island all by itself without any connection. It just wasn't part of the scope when the city put out that RFP. But we, like I say, we have, um, we have done those. We did not, let me, let me change that. Let me, let me, let me rethink about that. Because of the size, actually, we had we had uh, our engineers audit the building. It was not part of an efficiency Vermont retro commissioning, I believe, because of the size. It was just it was didn't really fit into that retro commissioning um, uh, program that they had, where they go in and tour the buildings and and you know poke and prod and take readings and stuff. And the Roxbury did not receive that because again the size of the building not qualify for that but our, our engineers went through and did do a report so i can i can share that with you great uh other questions well uh thank you so much ken and andrew this is uh super helpful and you know obviously an ongoing discussion that that uh you know the board is going to delve into more deeply and you know as andrew kind of stated the um, you know, what we've decided on uh, after the students presented. Uh, yeah, and it's good, it's good to see the progress that's been made. Uh, you know, thank you, Andrew, and all of the, the facilities um, folks who've, who've contributed to that. Uh, and, you know, with, I think, an infusion of some federal money that, that has come upon us, I think we'll have the opportunity to accelerate some of that progress in the next um, you know, few years. Uh, and build on that. So, so thank you. Um, uh, the next item in the board discussion is fundraising policy. Oh, um, was that a hand, Andrew, or are you just waving? Okay. Um, uh, is the fundraising policy? Um, this came out of a uh, an issue that that came up a couple of years ago that the policy committee had been pursuing. Um, I'm not sure what exactly we need to do on this tonight, other than kind of give an update. I think uh, there had been a placeholder uh, for this discussion uh, a while back. Um, so I don't know. I know we've got a a, a re. Uh, reconstituted policy committee um, of which I am a member, uh, a new member, um, this but was I'm not sure. Ryan, yeah, before Ryan left the board, he had asked to put this on the agenda in the spring for, um, to for the board to decide if they wanted the policy committee to take this up again or not. Yes. Well, I can, I can say that we talked about it um, before Ryan left and there are expenses now. He also, um, and Emma can can also jump in, um, but he did write a memo uh, so that there are two possible ways of going about this. So there is a memo that I can send, I think so, because it wasn't in the agenda. Um, I think like maybe we can talk about it next time, but there is already a process in place um, that Ryan, Emma and I talked about, um, and there's a memo about it, about how to like, what kind of decisions we also, but basically there are two ways um, to go about this conversation. One would be creating a policy. Um, there are, we have some resources, including uh, the UES committee uh, and the UES Caregivers Alliance created um, sort of like an equ equity focus uh, document that lays out some of this, this fundraising conversations about, you know, what to think about when doing fundraisers within the UES caregivers group. So I think there is, and, and there was extensive conversations that the, that Ryan and I don't know, Emma, if you were there, um, had with the principals and the MRSP PI last year as well. So basically, to make the long story short, there are notes, there is a memo, but we shouldn't discuss it today because nobody had the chance to read it. And so I can uh, put it out in document and send it for the next school board meeting. I wonder, should the new policy committee maybe take this up? And I, I see you 
is your hand still up, Jill, or did you take it down? No. Um, would that be another avenue just to, to have the new policy committee take a, a quick look at this and um, then come back? I, I feel like there's a, a, sure, but it's work that was already done. I think it's like, yes. If it's really already done, it might, it might just be easy just to give it straight to the board. Um, Jill? Emma has I changed my mind. <laughs> And I appreciate Amanda giving the update because I, I remember being a parent that was really concerned before I was a school board member about a particular fundraiser that I felt was really um, inappropriate in the, the sort of guilt trip it laid on our kids for raising money for certain field trips and the message that sends to students who may not have the means to participate in the fundraiser safely. So I'm really glad to hear that there's been work done that, on that. And I do think that the Caregivers Alliance and the um, parents group seems like they're really um, have made a lot of progress in the last year or so to sort of facilitate those. I think in this case, it was uh, in the case that I experienced, it was not even really through the parents group. It was just a direct to the school fundraiser. Um, so I'd be happy to help if there's something I can do to help. But it does sound like there's been a ton of work done already. And I, I definitely do think that once we're on the other end of COVID and kids are back in person, that I think it'd be helpful for the board to be really clear, you know, where, it, where it's appropriate for our role to um, set expectations about what is and isn't asked of our students for fundraising. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jill. Uh, Emma. Yeah, I'll just sort of chime in with Amanda's um, update from the policy committee. So Bridget, um, who is a lawyer and a former uh, board member, she had spent a long time, many months, um, researching what a policy would look like at the district level and trying to draft something that was appropriate, sort of where does the district, you know, where does the board's policy arm, where is it sort of an overreach, um, you know, and that sort of thing. So it became, so much more complicated. This is the report back to me from Bridget through Ryan, that the whole process became a lot more complicated than you would think at first blush, um, trying to write a district policy around fundraising that would, you know, um, it, basically it sounded like legally, we don't have control over parents group fundraising um, activities. And, you know, I, I'm not gonna get into the history too much, but I think that I know the fundraising um, gift card thing that you're talking about, Jill, at the middle school, and I believe it actually was a parents group fundraiser, but they were providing, you know, school time to promote the fundraiser. Anyway, it just gets very complicated. So we can control what the school does and we can make uh, a policy to, um, you know, control sort of what the school is allowed to do around fundraisers. This is what I understand anyway, and I didn't review, I wish I had reviewed the memo <laughs> before coming tonight, but, um, but, but, uh, and then we can make recommendations to the parents groups, but there's been a lot of work done, um, like maybe almost two years worth of work done on the fundraising, on the drafting, a first draft of a fundraising policy, and we still don't have it. And when Ryan uh, left, it sort of fizzled out. So I think Jim's right that it's um, probably time to revisit all of those notes and see where it stands. I think we're pretty close to having a draft, but every time we sort of dug into it and started talking about it, um, layers of complexity arose. So that's that's where we were at last I checked. Yeah, Amanda? Yeah, I'll just add, so just because I reviewed the memo this morning, um, when I saw that that was what it was. So basically our path forward is that there are two primary ways to do this. One is creating a consulting with a legal team. So both the Vermont School Board Association basically say there's, there is no real fundraising policy that it, it's good. You could, you could do a good luck with that because there's a lot of layers and it's very complex. So they said, you like the South Burlington School District has like a fundraising policy that is like very detailed. 
Um, so that is one way to do it, to consult a legal team, to do a comprehensive policy that would clearly articulate what would happen in the district related to any fundraising activities. And then the other alternative is that the board could do a global statement um, in like of intent regarding fundraising activities that leaves most of the decisions uh, for the administrators of each of the school district. And then, um, and so then we have to you know that the stakeholder participation and inclusion in the process of drafting, of drafting the framework itself will be taken into account. And then, um, you know, we, we have the reference of the UES equity um, event policy, which is what the UES Kegraves Alliance created. Um, and then the South Burlington poli policy, which is like hand in hand. So those are kind of the two ways um, to go about. And um, and so there's that, that memo, I think that, so for next steps, I would, my suggestion is that I just make this into a document and send it to the board for our next school board meeting. And then um, kind of going that decision, then it will fall into the policy committee if we decide together that policy is the way forward, so. So where should we, should we have the policy committee we take it up or? My suggestion is that I just send this document of the work that was already done to the school mm -hmm. board to have the a board. in the next school board meeting. And then if the full board after that discussion decides that policy is the way forward, that then the policy okay. committee will take it up. All right, good. Thanks for clarifying. Um, Mia, or your head went down. Um, does that make sense to everyone? All right. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Anything further on fundraising, or can we just do a quick overview of retreat planning? Uh, great. We'll move to retreat planning. So I've talked to, I believe, everyone. Um, just kind of generally about the retreat. Uh, we'd just love to kind of get some thoughts about how I'm thinking we've got two days. Uh, I was thinking of taking one day and just talking about kind of, you know, the the board uh, as a cohesive unit. Um, you know, we've got a lot of new members. Uh, unfortunately, most of our time has been virtually instead of in person. So uh, I was thinking about potentially getting uh, a facilitator to just talk through, uh, you know, our, our board roles, uh, board expectations, uh, also just how to, you know, build a really collaborative, you know, process uh, where we build trust, where we can, you know, disagree and, and have uh, and have robust conversations in a, you know, constructive, respectful manner. Uh, just getting, you know, just getting a real sense of kind of what this new board wants to be, how it wants to operate, uh, you know, the expectations around it, et cetera. Uh, and then using the second day uh, to kind of hone in on some uh, priorities for the coming year. Uh, and I also think part of the first day is just talking about how we, we kind of focus as well, because I think we've got a lot of big ideas and, and the district has a lot of, of challenges and opportunities. Uh, and then using the second day uh, to focus in on kind of a work plan for the coming year. Uh, some of the things we want to work on, uh, how that might build with uh, a longer term vision of, of priorities and things um, that we want to advance in the district. Uh, and I think for two days, that's more than more than plenty. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give thoughts if that all seemed to make sense. I've been talking to a few of you about potential uh, facilitators for that first day. Uh, I think there's a consensus building, one that I definitely share, uh, that while the VSBA has provided us some nice information that we want a facilitator that I think is gonna be more um, in tune to um, to kind of our unique challenges, and I think also some of the the vision to be a, a board that's 
uh, may be a little less traditional than uh, kind of the VSBA model and get a facilitator that can, can speak to that and, and plug into that energy. Um, uh, but you know, definitely further suggestions from members about, about who might be might be good in that role would be fantastic because we don't have a ton of time to, to kind of reach out and, and get someone down. Um, so we'd just love to open it up to, to kind of any thoughts uh, uh, about whether that general structure makes sense. Uh, and then as you know, if, if it does, as we kind of get more details, we can, um, you know, fill in at the next the next uh, meeting or two. Well, we don't have that many meetings. So um, yeah, so just want to open it up from there. Amia. Uh, I had a couple of visitors, so I just want to make sure I heard correctly and I understand. Yeah. The, um, the first day <laughs> it is focused more on really just building relationships yeah. among the board and, you know, getting to know each other a little better. And then the second day we'd end with um, perhaps some goals set for the year. Some, some kind of like priorities and, and work plans. Um, I see Tina looking, my guess is Roxbury will probably be one of those, but I think uh, setting a, a couple, a couple more uh, to, you know, just to focus us because, you know, the year can go quickly and, um, you know, set, it's kind of setting priorities. Obviously, other things will come up, but kind of like what what do we want to accomplish this year? And um, you know, I think frame that a little, and uh, you know, some some other priorities too, and kind of like how we might want to stage, uh, you know, stage stage priorities and stage initiatives. Yeah, that sounds good to me. I I um, I think with three hours on day two, it would be hard to come up with like real plans, but I think yep. prioritizing, prioritizing our priorities. <laughs> Sorry, I can't yes. think of a better word than that, but thinking about like, what is it that we want to be or what accomplished by the end of the year um, and get very clear about that um, feels both very good and doable with three hours on day two. Yeah, that's my hope too. Um, Amanda. I hate to be a negative, but I just uh, think that we need more, a little more time to like, you know, like I don't think three hours is enough um, to have these deep conversations. But um, I think that maybe if we could do some free work, um, I think in terms of transparency, like I think coming into the retreat, just like really thinking about what is everybody thinking so that everybody can have their thoughts organized. I think we, we and, and so, and I'm willing to support in doing a survey that, you know, we can compile around big ideas, little ideas. And, and so that before the retreat, we really have a sense of a global picture so that it's easier to dissect. Um, and that we can all kind of be transparent looking at what, like what those ideas look like um because this is also like a three-year period so you you know i i would see i would i could envision uh, like thinking that way as well as like you know here's a long-term vision here's like what we can do in year one year two and year three as well um so that you can spread we can spread our brains a little more because so when you try to focus just one year then like you have all these things that um, might be left. So, yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, and I did have conversations with all of you, kind of about those priorities, to kind of get people thinking in that perspective. And I can, I can kind of you know summarize those and send them around before uh, the next meeting. And maybe um, you know if others try to figure out how to to do this without tripping open meeting laws. Um, uh, but maybe I can summarize the document and then we can spend a little time at the next meeting after the, the SRO presentation, just kind of talking through that. Uh, but I, I totally agree that, that giving a lot of thought to this beforehand is going to make it make it go better. And and also, you know, this is I, I see the retreat as the beginning of a discussion, not the end. I kind of agree with Mia that we can, you know, find some points in the distance we want to head to um, and then, you know, map that out a little more clearly as, as we move forward. Uh, me again. 
I, I just wanted to co-sign Amanda's point about pre um, pre work for us to do bef before we get there. And um, um, I think the the work that you've done, Jim, to hear from each one of us is really good. And I also think about like how do we how do we think of ourselves or how do we act in this moment as the in in one of our roles being sort of like the representations of the community and how can we have community voice in um, in also thinking about what those priorities ought to be. Um, so I don't know if, you know, Amanda's idea of a survey goes more community wide or we look at, um, you know, Libby's just begun surveying the community around specifically how could we use those ESSER funds, but are there ideas that have come up through that that don't necessarily fall into the category of money or, you know, but but are really great ideas that we could bring into this conversation. So I wonder how we can get a broader perspective before we show up for, for those three hours um, is, I don't have any answers for that, but I, I would definitely want to encourage us to, to think about those, you know, what are the ways to do that. Um, and then the other thing that was, I forgot to mention for day one, maybe this is doing too much, but in addition to the relationship building, um, and I think you were kind of getting at this, Jim, and so if you were, then I'm just kind of plus wanting to that, is um, ending the day with some agreements for and sort of norms and procedures and how, how we will all work together um, as a board in order to accomplish whatever we're going to determine the next day are our priorities, um, I think would be really helpful. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, other uh, questions or comments? Jill. Yeah, I, I, I actually really like Amanda's idea of having us do some pre-work. Um, I had, it was really great to have that conversation with you, Jim, and, and I had prepared for it and I like put some sort of thought into things I want to make sure I said, but I don't have that level of understanding of what other folks' priorities are. And I think it'd be kind of neat to hear, especially if there's some consensus in some of those pieces. Um, and I think the structure you've talked about in the tree, I do think we need to just take that time in that first day to set up some norms and some common expectations and get to know each other that way. I think that would go a long way because I feel like we've all just been um, through this, you know, really intense period where it was really clear what the priorities were. And thankfully our administration and our teachers have carried us through that. And now we have the luxury of being able to look ahead at what we wanna do and maybe even some federal dollars to do it with. Um, so I, I, I really like that idea of having that kind of pre-work done and also um, having the space to get to know each other because things will continue to come up um, and we have a lot of priorities and a lot of possible work in this coming year or so. And um, I think it's great timing. So I'm willing to do whatever needs to be done beforehand so we can make the best use of, of that time because it will go by really quickly. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, and I, I definitely agree on um, getting kind of those priorities out. And I'll, I'll try to put together some sort of document and I'll talk to Libby about how best to to get some of those those ideas because because there was um yeah there was there was overlap and there was divergence um, um uh jerry um we did start the survey process in roxbury uh so you might want to reach out i don't know if libby has those or or if they're still with the principal but i believe we have at least a subset of data from the community members. So we could just use that as a data point. Great, thanks, Jerry. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, so I'm just thinking about how we take this suggestion of doing pre-work and turn it into action. And my inclination normally is to like, you know, set up set up a little group and people can collaborate and, you know, we wouldn't need to have like, part, part of I think what makes this so difficult is we're constantly trying and, and we're doing a good job um, to avoid open meeting law violations, but that then means we're not able to collaborate unless we're here in this space, which is very limiting. And I think that's impacting our ability to communicate 
in many ways. So I'm just thinking about, you know, how are we, how do we want to go? I, I can think of many organic processes that I've used in the workplace to uh, figure out a path forward on pre-work and, and have it have it have it evolved that way but how do we want to do this so that we can focus ourselves and and not break the open meeting law here and uh essentially get from a to b that's my question for our group uh amanda yeah i mean i i think there are ways that there's no violation of a meeting laws. Everything's transparent and open, and you have like a meeting that you have. But if we're thinking about hiring a facilitator, um, that that is it, that could be another way that we say here, facilitator. We want to make sure that here are some things we want to know where everybody's at and do some pre work, and you facilitate that process, and then that person can can do that. Like you know, that is is one thing that could be done, and. Um, created this course, which is who did the Montpelier Roxbury focus groups and who supported the the school safety committee, you know, is one that I, you know, that already kind of knows what's happening in the community and that could kind of already has some idea, I would think, um, around what's happening in our district. Um, and and so I I, I mean I, I think I just want to offer that we do have some expertise in here in the school board of people that kind of like do this too, that um, and community members that we can ask for support in terms of in terms of like these conversations. For me, that the um, I was just part of another group that also has open meeting laws attached to them, but the, there is you know like for the how to be together. There's also this conversation around um, that we could go in executive session and just have an open, vulnerable discussion about how to be together. Um, that is that is a little more humane. That you can like we can actually like say what we without you know being aware that we're on TV or something like that. So um, I just did a training with a state board on inclusive bias, for example, and it was an executive session and no recording so that people could be, um, who they are and we could have like really good conversations about how to, how to, how to work together. So I think, you know, there are ways to do this work that is like humane, that takes us as humans <laughs> instead of the, the, I think the open meeting laws is a tool actually to be transparent to the community that we are accountable for. Um, and so I don't I don't think that a survey violates open meeting laws um, and it's, it's a step forward. Yeah, no, I, w I wasn't suggesting that it violates open meeting laws. I'm, I'm really asking the group, how do we want to, you know, essentially, we're talking about doing this pre-work. What do we want this to look like? How do we make this happen? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we could like easily do a a survey monkey. I mean, as long as it's not interactive, it can go into a, a document and then we can discuss it publicly. Uh, but as long as we're not editing off of each other's work, I think like a survey monkey for the board would be an easy first way to start. Maybe is that something you could have Anna send around? Just like maybe I would check we can the, we can talk about it on Friday but I would um, check with the VSBA first to see if that does violate or not because I I don't yeah. know if it does or not so I would I would check before doing that yeah but yes we can I mean logistically if it's if it's allowable then yeah of course we can do that that's that's easy hey, Jim yep I also like Amanda's idea of asking the facilitator yeah. to maybe take this on as part of the work because then we don't have to worry about how to ask the questions, which questions, how to compile and report out on the data. I mean, all of that takes some time and thought and effort. So um, maybe that's something we could include. Well, and another thing that that raises is would we want the facilitator for both days? So the facilitator might start by actually doing 
a lot of this work and like surveying the board and then thinking about it, it, it might be, it might be worth, it would be more money, but it might be worth having the facilitator, you know, do the second day as well. So that way they come in saying, okay, you know, I talked to all of you individually or, you know, reach out to you by email. I've got all these priorities and have them to kind of do some synthesis beforehand and, um, have the starting place of the discussion. Uh, Jill. Yeah. And I, I, I want to be realistic too, that it's April 7th and I, I know that everybody is, has pretty busy full-time jobs and, and I really don't want to add to anybody's plate. Um, so I'm happy to, as a, as a plan B or maybe a plan A, take you up on your offer, Jim, to summarize what you heard. And if there's a way that you could share that and we could kind of react to that maybe in a survey or something like that, because that would, that would get us a pretty good head start. And I think having had that perspective and time, you could probably, you know, pull that together. And, and, and like you said, having seen some patterns and some discrepancies, I mean, I, I'm just trying to be realistic about, um, I don't know how realistic it is to get a facilitator in a month um, who, could, who could do this work yeah. well for us. And I also, um, this might be an unpopular opinion, but it's occurring to me if we only have three hours each day, sometimes that can get eaten up a lot by facilitation. And I, I want to make sure we all have a lot of time to actually talk to each other and it might get messy and you know, we're only human and we might get tired and we might have to sort of self-police, but it might be more realistic than hiring a facilitator who could come on board and prepare. So I just want you, I'm very, I'm happy with whatever we can end up doing, but I think realistically, I, I'm fine. If, if that's what we can do, then that's what we can do. And I'm, I'm willing to be a grown up about it. <laughs> Great. No, thanks, Joe. That's um, super, super helpful. And I may, I want to, regardless of what you do, I, I definitely want to summarize and um having some help help there would be helpful i have i have the pile of notes i just haven't gotten to the synthesis mm -hmm. part of it um am I, is that an old hand or it's always an old right. and i'm getting old uh any other any other questions or comments? Otherwise, uh, I'll talk. I'll look at kind of whether we could do some sort of survey. Um, we'll do a little more investigation on a on a facilitator. I totally hold hear you, Jill, and I think that's why like having the right facilitator who's going to be able to, um, you know, kind of I think get quickly to to where we need to go rather than spending you know an hour on a kind of, you know, icebreaker exercise or something, which I know can happen, um, would be important. Uh, and why don't we just do a, another kind of update? Um, and, you know, if we can do a survey, we'll, you know, try to, to work on that between now, but we meet in a week because of spring break. So um, let's do another check-in on this next week uh, with, um, you yeah, know, and kind of see where we're at. But it sounds like directionally, um, relatively on course, and it's just kind of making sure we get the, the pre-work done correctly. All right, excellent. Um, uh, next on the list is executive session. Um, and I've lost my agenda. I um, don't know how that happened. Um, but next on the list is executive session. And it's for the purpose of negotiation, so we need the magic words. Um, if someone can approximate emotion with those in, that would be fantastic. Uh, Mia looks like she's going to bravely, was that a brave raise of your hand? Jill's ready to go. I don't want to steal her thunder. Okay, Jill. <laughs> oh, no, go for it. I was going to plagiarized from Anna's memo that she sent. All uh, I was going to do. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's the right the right lingo. Uh, let's see. So I, I moved to find that premature general public knowledge regarding our negotiations contracts would place the board at a substantial disadvantage. 
um, if the board discusses the negotiations in public. I second that. Second. Um, Agate? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Mia? Aye. Jill? Aye. Amanda? Yes. And Emma? Aye. Uh, now, uh, motion to actually go into executive session. So move. Second. Okay. Uh, and again. Hi. Kristen. Hi. Jerry. Hi. Andrew. Hi. Mia. Hi. Jill. Hi. Amanda. Hi. Emma. Hi. Great. Um, so. Uh, so move. move. Second. Mia? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Jill? Aye. Anakit? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Vonda? Aye. Emma? Aye. Great. See you uh, all next week. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.